I have to, I lose my record button if I do that before I share my screen. So <laughs> we will go to the screen. All right. Let's see if we get it started here. All right. Oh, Again, it says he started to do screen sharing. He's there. All right. Here we go. Uh, so tonight uh, we're on commandment number two of the Ten Commandments of Marriage, and we want to uh, dive right in here. And before you think that that title is referring to newlyweds, uh, there's a lot more to it than what might appear at the beginning. Uh, Ed Young offers this personal word. He says, when we stand at the altar, we in effect are telling our mate that he or she is number one. But if we're still attached to parents or past places and people, our spouse in reality may not even be in our top 10. To leave, cleave, and become one, you have to cut the apron strings. And that's our, our second commandment, is thou shalt cut the apron strings. During a group session, a counselor asked three men, what would you do if you knew you only had four weeks to live? That's easy, the first man answered. I'd go to Las Vegas, have a good time spending all my money. You can't take it with you, so I may as well live it up before I go. That was his mentality towards uh, how to, uh, if you only had four, me four weeks to live, he would just live it up. Well, many people, unfortunately, think that way. The second guy, the group's humanitarian, said, I'd go out and serve my fellow man any way I could. I would minister to people and try to make their lives better. Playing catch up. Uh, the counselor turned to the third man and waited for his response. Without hesitation, the man answered, I would move in with my mother-in-law and I would stay with her every minute of every day for the whole four weeks. That's a little odd, the counselor replied. Why would you do that when there are more enjoyable and productive ways to spend the last weeks of your life? Because, the man answered, those would be the four longest weeks of my life. <laughs> my apologies to any mother-in-law who might be reading this or hearing this, but you know more than anyone else how mother-in-law jokes abound in our culture. We laugh at them, not necessarily out of disrespect, but because so often they contain small nuggets of truth. Some marriages enjoy mutual love and respect between in-laws. In fact, my wife has a great mother-in-law. Uh, actually, so do I. <laughs> but sadly, however, many other marriages have to endure the constant meddling of parents-in-law or other relatives. Interference in marriage, of course, doesn't come only from well-meaning in-laws. It can also come from friends other family members, even ex-spouses, ex-boyfriends, and ex-girlfriends. So the last thing a married couple needs is external or internal interference, which brings us to our second commandment for marriage, thou shalt cut the apron strings. So when we say cut the apron strings, we're really referring to any outside interference in the marriage. And you might say, well, I, I'm not, you know, attached to my parents anymore, or, you know, they're no longer part of the picture. But there may be other outside influences that are affecting your marriage. So this is worth looking at. It's worth examining, even if you might say, well, it's, it's not in-laws that are the issue. Uh, there still may be some other outside influence. Um, so we'll talk about that today. So uh, marriage is God's perfect design. Oh, my slide's going fast here. Okay. Um, when you think about design, you think about the Statue of Liberty. Uh, when they built it, the, the winds in New York Harbor would push and tug at the huge mass of copper, rip it apart if the statue weren't built right. The money would even collapse under its own weight if its components weren't correctly placed in relationship. So the designer, or the kind of designed the, the outside of it, um, August Bartoldi, he turned to Gustav Eiffel, the structural engineer who built the famous tower bearing his name. The Statue of Liberty, Eiffel constructed a core of steel and iron, then attached frame supports to its central portion. Eiffel's knowledge of which parts should adjoin and which should have separate loads made possible the beloved statue that welcomes the world to America. In a similar way, God carefully designed the structure of marriage to hold up in every type of storm. His key design principle for strong marriages can be summed up in two words, leaving and cleaving. So these are the two key words uh, to a successful marriage, and this will solve a lot of issues. Uh, so even in marriage, certain elements must be joined for the sake of strength, 
while certain other components must be separated lest their combined weight bring down the whole structure. So God's blueprint for marriage, right at the beginning, Adam and Eve's relationship was husband and wife. God told the pair, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. So five times this command appears in the Bible. Think about that, five times. Uh, now, whenever God says anything, we know it's important. When he states something twice, we put a star by it or underline it, but five times? Uh, do you get the idea he's trying to get our full attention? Just as, by way of comparison, Jesus' name baptism is in the Bible five times. This is on this almost <laughs> you know, equal number of times here, this statement, thou shalt leave father and mother and cleave unto his wife, there should be one flesh. It's been there five times. Uh, so God's statement to Adam and Eve contains three crucial words, leave, cleave, and flesh. Understanding these three words provides the key to understanding the way God meant for marriage to function. I believe that all marital problems stem from the husband's or wife's failure to fully follow the instructions of Genesis 2.24, to leave, cleave, and become one flesh. So if we can get this right, we're on our way to a healthier, stronger, and happier marriages. Uh, it really is that simple. Uh, you know, if you boil it down to its basic components, it's leaving everything else, it's cleaving to your spouse, and truly becoming one flesh. Uh, anyone having issues in their marriage, it's usually one of these three areas. Uh, and oftentimes, these three will diagnose a deeper issue somewhere that's interfering with that, but that's really the goal of marriage, is to leave, cleave, and become one. In our culture, when an eligible man and woman meet and express a mutual interest, a dating relationship often begins. During this courtship period, the couple discovers differences and similarities in goals, desires, dreams, even likes and dislikes. Eventually, they may unite in marriage. So you come together uh, like glue. And you think about crazy glue, if you've ever had it on your fingers and it gets stuck together, <laughs> you think about one flesh. The crazy glue will make you one flesh with any other flesh you touch with crazy glue on it. Um, in fact, they now have medical grade crazy glue to glue up cuts and things because it will literally bond skin. Uh, when we say cleave, we don't quite mean as to become one flesh in that sense, but <laughs> you want to be stuck together like glue. Um, so that's kind of a one strong bond is, is the point here that, you know, marriage should be a strong bond between a man and his wife. And that's really how strong the bond of marriage is meant to be. Uh, so the, maybe another example, you think of in, in a lot of weddings, they have unity candle ceremonies. You know, the two candles represent each family or their individuality before marriage. And they come and they light that single candle. And that's to represent the fact that after marriage, they're going to be one single unit. And, you know, that's kind of a, an illustration that you find in a lot of um, weddings, or you may find, you know, they'll pour different colored sand together and make a new color or something with layers in it or something. And, uh, you know, these are all symbols of how a, two people can become one. And they're trying to demonstrate that, you know, there's, there's that one thing. Um, now, this Im imagery doesn't really happen when two people marry. Uh, God intends the marriage partner to keep his or her own identity. The bride is still the bride, the groom, the groom. They're still distinctly male and female. Each keeps his or her own personality, needs, and gifts. But in marriage, all their separateness bonds together to create something stronger and deeper than what existed before. They are now husband and wife. So when a man and woman leave and cleave, they become one. Uh, so this is God's divine math. One plus one equals one. There's true uh, oneness. When they come together, they have one flesh, one agenda, one marriage unit. If every couple had a clear understanding of what they are to leave and to what they are to cleave, every marriage could enjoy the structural dependability that God designed in the beginning. No storm could bring it down. So there's this joining together. Um, and of course, this starts with the idea that you have to leave. There, there's some things you have to leave in order to become one with your spouse. So what does God mean when he tells us we are to leave father and mother? Uh, let me first say what he's not saying. By no means is God suggesting that we terminate our relationships with our parents when we marry. We, he simply wants us to know that our parents are no longer the preeminent figure in our lives. Our mates should now hold that exalted position. So it's no longer a case of, uh, you know, you're going to your parents all the time for the first thing. You go to 
your spouse instead. Certainly every mother occupies a place that no other woman can take in the life of her son. But once he marries, she is no longer the number one woman in his life. That spot is now reserved for his wife. Likewise, while no one can ever take the place of a daughter's daddy, the woman's husband, not her father, is the most important man in her world. Married couples must remember they have entered a relationship in which they commit to honor one another, tend to one another's needs, obey one another, and keep themselves from one another in every way. Children who get married need to leave, and the parents need to let them go. And this is really um, a chapter for parents in many ways that um, I would say my wife's parents and my own parents were excellent at this. They uh, intentionally and probably with much self-control really gave my wife and I room to be ourselves. And they, to my knowledge, have never interfered in our relationship. My wife can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember a time when either my parents or her parents tried to interfere in our relationship. And that's uh, intentional on the part of our parents that they knew in order for us to have a strong marriage, uh, they needed to give us room to um, be on our own two feet sort of thing. That's not to say they didn't help us from time to time, but there was um, a distance that was put there. Um, so we could call this process cutting the apron strings. So there are two primary apron strings that every couple must cut. Number one, the counseling string. Um, and this is where, again, this isn't just referring to parents. This could be anybody that you go to for advice on a regular basis. Um, don't take every problem in your marriage and go talk to that person that you go to for advice all the time. Um, it, will, it will be very hard on your marriage if you keep talking to someone outside the relationship about what's going on between you and your spouse. Um, and that's not to say there isn't a place for counseling. Um, but your, your friend that you talk to on a regular basis shouldn't be the one guiding your marriage. That should be a decision made between you and your spouse. Um, so this really starts off with parents, for young people in particular. It says, we often depend on our parents for advice. The first apron string I suggest severing is the counseling string. You can tell your parents to cut that string or give them this section of the book. Let them read those two points, you know, because that this chapter is for parents. After all, it's best that parents initiate this cut. So these two points are written primarily to parents. As they grow up, our children need our advice and it feels good being needed. But after they marry, we need to back off and let our married children work out their problems on their own. Um, and that can be hard for parents to do, but it's so important that they do this and really uh, make, make an effort to, yeah, I'm, I can see, I, I want to be involved, I want to tell them this is a bad idea, but they need to figure it out on their own and, and let couples, um, you know, make their own mistakes. Uh, if they ask for advice as a couple, uh, you can provide it, of course, but uh, really you don't want to be jumping in and trying to fix things um, without being asked by both of them. Uh, so what, does this mean that an in-law should never offer counsel or advice? Of course not. At times, every family needs outside counsel. I'll repeat that. At times, every family needs outside counsel. And the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. I believe the Bible teaches the importance of getting good counsel. This is why I definitely recommend, if you're having issues in marriage, that you do find a good Christian counselor. There's, there's some real benefits to having an objective person being able to uh, step in and help. The problem is in-laws and parents are rarely objective uh, and your friends are rarely objective. So this is why when it comes to counseling, you don't need your friends and your family providing it. You wanna get somebody that's outside the picture um, that can apply biblical principles to the relationship and call each of you out on where you need to repent. <laughs> which is usually what much counseling really boils down to. Um, but of course, they can also provide insight, understanding, and advice. Um, so this is really important uh, that we do recognize, first of all, that from time to time, every family will need outside help. Um, and you can go to your parents, you know, from time to time or whoever. Um, but it's, it's important to, as a parent, if you're the one that people are coming to for advice, you can offer valuable perspective. Remember, however, wise parents understand they must listen to all sides, including the position of their in-law children. 
As you listen quietly, pray, and encourage, the day comes when you'll discover you are genuinely loved, respected, and heard. And that comes from being able to hear all sides. And, uh, you know, my mom in particular has really adopted my wife as hers. So this is the other daughter I never had. And my in-laws the same. They consider me their son. There's um, a relationship there that is maybe not as strong as with their birth children, but it's it's close that they're going to treat each of us as their own child. It's not like, oh, well, who's this other person that's coming to our family and they're causing problems? It's no, this is my child now. I'm going to treat them the same as I treat my own child. Um, of course, we're all adults, but that, that mentality makes a big difference for in-laws in the home. Uh, now, to the person who has left or is leaving, mother and father, setting up a household does not mean you must terminate the relationship with your parents. You are to leave them, not forsake them, nor forgo all their influence. After we marry, we are still to obey the Lord's command to honor our mother and father. The hard-won experience of parents can still play a vital role in the lives of their married children. The Bible contains many wonderful examples of just that. So you want your parents' advice. You want to seek them out. You want to find you know, insight from their experience, that sort of thing. We're not saying that you shouldn't be seeking their advice, um, but we are saying that we don't want parents interfering without being asked um, because that can cause a lot of problems. Consider Naomi, the consummate mother-in-law who had a beautiful relationship with her daughter-in-law, Ruth. We call Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Jethro pulled Moses aside, told him he was working himself to death. He advised him how to be a more efficient leader and administrator. Moses followed his father-in-law's advice and made his life and his service to God much more effective. So this was a great example of an in-law that was able to offer wisdom and advice in a way that was helpful. It's not always easy for parents to cut the ties and allow their children to leave and start their own marriages and families. Likewise, it's hard for some married children to leave behind the security of the homes and lifestyles in which they grew up. But if you want a healthy marriage, you must leave the safety net of your parents behind and create your own home sweet home. And that brings us to uh, the next string that needs to be cut, and that is the economic strings. <sighs> And I have a bit of a graphic here. Any uncut strings can become puppet strings um, because some married couples stay too closely attached to parents and in-laws for reasons related to money. I suggest that parents cut economic strings. To not do so may make the couple dependent or even resentful. Uh, he gives an example. Here. He says, when Elizabeth's husband died, leaving her a fortune, she lavished her married children and their families with homes, cars, every luxury they desired. But Elizabeth's acts of generosity always came with a catch. Every time one of her children made a decision she questioned, Elizabeth would say, after all I've done for you, you still won't do what I want. It became a form of manipulation. Her children became heavily dependent on her and were so easy to manipulate, and not surprisingly, they became extremely resentful. Uh, Anne and Bill had a healthier view. They discussed the level of support their children would receive from them when the kids reached adulthood. They determined they would help their children get established, then pull back so the kids could support themselves. Anne and Bill paid most college expenses, helped their son and daughter buy their first homes. Then, although they had plenty of money, Anne and Bill reduced their financial support for their children and their families. With the economic string cut, Anne and Bill's family enjoyed a relationship free of manipulation and guilt. So they kind of helped give them a good launch, got them started in life, helped them buy their homes, and then it was hands off, they're, they're on their own now. Uh, it gives the example, you know, it's kind of like the way eagles launch their eaglets, before they know how to fly, they push them out of the nest and throw them over the cliff. And the eagle, the, the mother eagle or the father eagle will go down and they will catch that eaglet as it's falling off the side of the cliff and bring it back up to the nest and do it again. And they do this until that eaglet learns how to fly. And, you know, there's, there's this kind of weaning off of mom and dad, but there's this, at the same time, mom and dad are there to catch them so they don't, they don't hurt themselves and fall on the rocks but they're there to catch them as they fall out of the nest or are pushed out of the nest actually by their parents. And I kind of remember times with my own parents, my dad in particular was usually the one pushing out of the nest. He had made it very clear when I was still in my mid teens that when I became an adult, I would not be welcome to stay at home, that I was to find my own place, find my own way. And, you know, he said, well, when you turn 18, you're out of here. <laughs> you know, that was just kind of, <laughs> and it wasn't said in an unkind way or anything like that, but he wanted to make sure that I knew how to stand on my own two feet and support myself and my family, that sort of thing. And uh, we were newly married, my wife and I, and I was just laid off from my job. 
I was seasonal work on the farm. And the next day, my dad's there with the classified ads in the newspaper. And he say, well, here's the job. So you're going to go get yourself a new job now. And I'm like, oh, I thought I got a week off or something before I got to start looking for work. <laughs> but dad's like, no, no, no. You, you've got a wife to support. You, you start looking for work now. <laughs> and I never forgot that. But it, it was one of those things where, um, you know, even though I was married, my dad was like, no, you, you need to get out of the nest because you're not sticking around <laughs> mom and dad's place much longer. Within a week, I had a job. Um, <laughs> but that was that was just one of those areas where, um, you know, my, my parents made sure that I had that, that good launch. Um, so again, the warning is economic strings can become uh, a power struggle between parents and children. So you wanna be aware of that. Leaving past people. Um, this is so important. Uh, hanging on to all the girls or guys you've loved before can lead to the greener grass syndrome. It's only a matter of time before your conflict erupts in your marriage. If you don't leave your past loves, you'll feel tempted to mentally compare your partner with that person from your past. Thoughts such as, if only I'd married Sally instead, or I know Bill would have acted differently in this situation, can drive a wedge between a husband and a wife. Um, you and I both know there really is no greener grass. Every meadow has its share of beggar lice, blighted spots, and thorns. So how do you get greener grass? By watering the grass you already have. Irrigate and cultivate what you have with your mate rather than gazing longingly at former relationships. Don't get stuck looking back. Uh, this morning, Pastor David preached about Lot's wife looking back at Sodom, um, turned into a pillar of salt. Well, that can happen in a marriage too. You start looking back at a previous relationship and it's going to ruin what you have. Uh, so rather than do that, forget the past and look ahead and begin to cultivate uh, what's right in front of you. So it's very, very important. Leave past people. Don't, don't allow them to have any influence over your current relationship. Leaving past problems. No one can successfully cleave in marriage without first leaving problems of the past. Some individuals discover only after they get married that they can't function because of previous failures or abuse suffered in an earlier relationship. This is not a small thing, and we can't cover it in depth here tonight, but I, it's worth bringing up. And if this is you, um, find uh, whatever help you need to find to be able to get uh, healing for past problems. It mentions you know, previous failures or abuse, these are deep issues that can seriously uh, affect your relationship if not dealt with. Um, I don't want to skip over that too quickly. It's, it's very important. Um, you want to bring your best self into your marriage. You don't want to bring, um, I hate to use the word baggage, uh, but anything from a prior relationship or previous hurt or pain you don't want that to affect your relationship with your spouse today. So it's very important to uh, make sure that you're uh, able to give your best self to your spouse uh, completely, that there's nothing in your life that you're um, not able to bring to the table. Uh, so when baggage filled with those past problems sits in the middle of the room, whether in the honeymoon suite or the bedroom at home, it blocks everything. The problems of the past adversely affect conversation between a husband and wife, their sexual relationship, and their trust. And this is so, so vital to the becoming one aspect of leaving, cleaving, and one flesh that it is, it is not, um, it's not an option to sweep it under the rug. I'll put it that way. This is not something you can just pretend isn't there or ignore it. So, well, uh, we're just going to, you know, pretend this doesn't exist. Um, there, there's things that need to be dealt with. Two years shy of 30, Rose still carried the guilt of her high school years when her promiscuity had led to three abortions. When she married John, she thought she had dealt with her past, but on their wedding night, as her husband caressed her, all she could think about was her lurid history. She stiffened and became cold. Uh, you know, guilt can be a killer uh, to your marriage. And if, if there's anything... Uh, it's causing guilt in your marriage. First of all, take it to the Lord. The blood of Jesus covers all sin. He is able to uh, restore us and make us whole again. And we can take those sins to the Lord and really uh, make sure that it's under the blood. 
and know that God is already taking care of any guilt and anything from our past. It can be completely forgotten. It's in God's sea of forgetfulness, and it shouldn't be able to impact our relationship today. But if it is, uh, then you may want to uh, talk to your pastor, talk to a good counselor, pray it through, um, study some scripture on forgiveness and what God has done for us, and know that that does not have to be a part of any hindrance in your marriage today. If we want our marriages to reflect well on God, it is essential that we leave our past mistakes right where they belong in the past. We need to leave the things we've done and those things done to us at the foot of the cross. So again, this comes back to that abuse point of view that um, our, we can't just move on without healing. So we, we need to uh, be able to give that to the Lord. Um, and when it comes to past abuse or anything of that nature, I would say it's very essential if, if you're struggling to overcome that, to talk to a professional counselor, um, you know, talk to someone that has some training in trauma. I recommend um, an apostolic counselor. Um, we have several uh, apostolic counselors are very well qualified in this right now. Um, so, you know, Brother and Sister Chevrolet's daughter has just finished her training in this area, and that's one area, one person I would recommend you to. Um, but there's so many things that we can just, you don't have to put up with it. You can, you can give it to the Lord, you can uh, find healing, and God can take care of that. You don't know how bad it is for me, you may be thinking. I mean, it's such a horrible mistake, I can't forgive myself, I just can't forget this and leave it in the past. Well, uh, would you like the key to get rid of, getting rid of those footlockers full of past junk. If so, you'll find it in the principle of confession and repentance. That's really what a lot of this boils down to. We confess our sin to God and turn away from it. He's more than able and willing to forgive us and cleanse us from all the trash from our past. And, you know, that's, you know, when it's our fault, you know, it's something we've been doing. Um, and that's everything. God, I mean, God doesn't pick and choose which sins he's going to forgive. He cleanses us inside out. Every sin can be removed. So again, don't let guilt uh, corrupt your relationship with your spouse. Micah 7.19, the Bible says he casts our sin into the depths of the sea. You know, God, God removes our sin. Uh, he forgets it. So lay your sins and mistakes, the ones you committed in high school, the ones you committed in college, the ones you've committed since then at the foot of the cross. Then leave them there for God to pick up and bury at the bottom of the sea. Don't let it affect your relationship today. That brings us to uh, the next one. And that is um, leaving past places. Um, it's unusual. It does happen for people to marry uh, their childhood sweetheart. The author of our um, book we're going through here today, Ed Young, he said he and his wife met in the nursery at the church, and they weren't dropping off their kids. They were the kids. So they've known each other all their lives. And, you know, sometimes we have uh, couples where that's the case, but it is rare. Uh, most couples meet um, later in life, and you're going to have past experiences that um, you're just going to have to leave behind. Um, you know, that, that can't be um, something that's constantly coming into your relationship, that sort of thing. When you talk about special places or events from your pre-marriage days, especially if your mate was not present, you run the high risk of making him or her feel left out or estranged. Um, alienation from a husband or wife can result whenever we fail to leave the things that prevent us from cleaving to our mate. Um, what kind of things? Take your pick. An unhealthy emotional or material dependency on parents, the people who once dominated your relationships, the problems brought on by past behaviors, the places where you had experiences apart from your spouse. So if you're going somewhere with your spouse and every time you walk in there, it's memories of all these times you had with previous friends you had you might want to find somewhere else to go <laughs> or create new memories there with your spouse and not think about those other things but all such strings have to be cut if we were to keep our marriage structure sound um, so these are uh, important things that we we can't cling to it's it's not wrong to have memories obviously of, of times before marriage but um, when you're becoming one with your spouse you're really creating a whole new life uh, for the two of you together, and you want that to be your main focus. And, you know, if you're constantly pining for the days before you were married, um, that's a problem. <laughs> uh, 
um, so cleave to the covenant of marriage. Um, leaving is important, but as important as leaving is, it's only a first step. Marriage is a two-step dance, and cleaving is a second step. With that in mind, let's look at some important things to which we should cleave. So we talked about what we need to leave, but the first thing we need to cleave to is the covenant of marriage. When a couple stands before me at the altar, I always say something like this, do you promise to love and cherish, to honor, sustain, in sickness as in health, in poverty as in wealth, in the bad that may darken your days, and in the good that may lighten your days, do you promise, so help you God. Yet to perform a wedding in which a bride or groom has answered, I don't. A few have taken a while to get it out, but they always answer, I do. And they truly believe with all their hearts they will keep those vows. Uh, so what happens at this I do moment? In exchanging vows, the woman, the man and woman seal a covenant with one another and with God. It's as if they sit down at a table with God to convince him and their family and friends that they want to spend their lives together exclusively. Um, the Lord Jesus pronounces the benediction, what therefore God has joined together, let no man separate, Matthew uh, 19, 6. So going back to the triangle relationship we used last week with uh, the man and the wife at the bottom and God at the top, and as you get closer to God, you get closer together as husband and wife, uh, the result of such a covenant relationship is a fulfilling and dynamic marriage. So Many choose to marry in a civil ceremony before a judge or justice of the peace. In that regard, I always think of the old guy who said, yeah, I got married at a justice of the peace, and my wedding day is the last time I saw either one of them, justice or peace. <laughs> There's a difference between <laughs> just making that contract and having a covenant in which God is involved. And that's, that's a good contrast to look at uh, whether you got married in a Christian church or a justice of the peace or a quickie wedding chapel in Las Vegas, you still have taken part in a covenant agreement laid out by God in which he told us to leave and cleave. Marriage is a covenant, not a contract. In a morally and socially chaotic world where half of new marriages shattered through divorce, prenuptial agreements, a contractual arrangement have become increasingly in vogue. Arlene Dubin, a New York divorce lawyer, says that some 20% of couples engaged for marriage seek prenuptial agreements. You can imagine that many. Um, consider the stark contrast between a marriage covenant and a contract. You have it here on the screen. A covenant is based on love. A contract is motivated by commitment. A covenant is based on law. A contract is motivated by compulsion. A covenant assumes relationship till death do us part. A contract prepares for marriage to fail. A covenant says what's mine is yours. A contract protects what's mine. A covenant prepares for life together, and a contract prepares for life apart. Because most contracts are really about, well, what happens if this relationship dissolves? Um, couples seeking contractual agreements seem to expect that someone or something will separate what God has joined together. And, you know, we don't want to start off with the premise that we assume the relationship is going to end. They appear to see such an agreement as an easy way to open the back door for a swift and clean getaway. You choose to operate your marriage only as a legal contract. You may stay together. You may even love one another deeply, but all you have is you, your mate, and the state. You will miss the dynamic relationship that comes only with the spiritual bonding and intimacy of a divine covenant. God's formula and only his formula gives significance, creativity, and sizzle to a marriage. So cleave to the sacred reality of the marriage covenant and understand that what God joins together, no man or no thing is to drive apart. And many people miss this point. It, well, you know, it's just a piece of paper. No, this is a covenant, and God is involved in it. This is, this is something that God is involved in. Uh, even if you do just go to the justice of the peace, God is still present. And God uh, created marriage, and he is uh, involved in every marriage covenant. And, of course, we want to cleave to God's principles. If that's the case, if God is the creator of marriage, if God has put marriage together, we need to cleave to God's principles and understand that in order to have a successful marriage, we need to have it God's way. So I apply his truth to our marriage. Um, biblical principles are so, so important uh, to help and heal a hurting marriage. That will help us to have a strong and healthy marriage. Um, so the single biblical principle we've been exploring in this chapter, leaving and cleaving, is enough to get a couple through any kind of crisis. Imagine that. Any kind of crisis. If we can just leave and cleave, leave the world's thinking, leave the past, leave, you know, cut those strings of economic strings, uh, counseling strings, whatever, 
cleave to your spouse, uh, no matter what, and that will get you through. The Bible contains additional wisdom on how to handle everything from the smallest conflicts to the most major crises. Even if the marriage gets fragmented, we can give the pieces to God, apply the principles shown in Scripture, and watch Him do a supernatural work of restoration. I have seen this happen, where couples that had been split up, God put back together, and God is able to do that. Um, every one of the 10 marriage commandments in this book is rooted on the principles of God, his true truth. The key to using God's principles in your marriage is to make sure you don't just read about them, but that you apply them to every facet of your marriage. So again, it comes down to, am, am I applying these principles to my marriage, to my home, to my family? These are so, so important. Um, so we want to uh, cleave to the Lord, cleave to his principles, cleave to his word. Um, and cleave to your mate. Uh, the earlier super glue illustration might have led some readers to think that cleaving means a husband and wife must become inseparable. That's not what cleaving means. Uh, husbands and wives don't have to be together physically all the time. In fact, you might drive your spouse crazy if that were the case. Uh, sometimes people need their space. Um, you know, it wouldn't even be possible. But they do need to be together in their hearts. And, you know, that might sound corny, but it is true. Um, you know, we need to have that, you know, what bothers your spouse should bother you. What hurts them hurts you. What, when they're insulted, you're insulted. There's something to this oneness that you feel what they feel. And we strengthen each other, encourage each other. We hold each other. In other words, we cleave in both good times and in bad. Just like Adam and Eve were to be one uh, in every way. You know, when the Bible says one flesh, a lot of people think that's simply referring to the sexual aspect of marriage, but it's so much more than that, that when two people become one, it involves uh, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Um, he gives uh, some examples here of a hunting trip he went on, and he's, he's up on the mountain, and he's looking down, and he sees uh, two streams coming together, and they become a river. And he said, one stream, you know, it had all this debris in it from uh, erosion further up the mountain. And the other one was kind of full of silt or whatever. And the two streams where they met suddenly became very turbulent. This was full of rapids and very fast moving water. And then he looked downstream where it started to level off. And he found the, the river was very slow moving, steady and clear. The waters were, were very clear. And so it's the same kind of thing with marriage. Two, two people come together, and you may have all kinds of different issues. And when you join together, that creates a lot of turbulence. There's, especially initially, as you learn to become one, and there's all this happening and turmoil, and things are being rooted up. And then over time, that turns into beautiful harmony as you become one, and there's that maturity in the relationship. Um, if we're to have this oneness in our marriages, we must do everything we can to cleave to our mates physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We're wise if we do it just the way God planned it when he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So God's picture of true unity within a marriage. As we walk in his principle of leaving and cleaving, we'll fulfill the promise of oneness. It works every time. So a couple of... Uh, questions here uh, or sets of questions one for if you're married one for if you're not married but if you are married on whom did you depend most before you married uh, before you were married who did you depend on the most how has marriage affected that prior relationship whether that was with your parents or someone else um, how has marriage affected that prior relationship number three describe the greatest bond between you and your spouse uh, you know where do you really connect with your spouse? What are some of the things that really bring you together? And what specific things do you need to leave in order to intensify the bond between you and your spouse? Is there something you're still hanging on to that's coming between you and your spouse? Is there something you need to let go of in order to um, deepen your relationship? And uh, I don't want to hurry past that question because I've seen this in many, many relationships somebody's focused on something else and it's interfering with their relationship and you know 
that could be anything, <laughs> but um, you want your spouse to be number one in your life after God. I was always taught that God first, then your spouse. Um, your spouse should be right up there with Jesus, that they're the number one most important person in this world. And, you know, God always comes first, but after God, it's, it's your spouse. And it might be worth noting here, it's not your kids, it's your spouse. Um, your kids come after your spouse. <laughs> Today's thinking is that your kids come before your spouse, and it's, it's turned the whole thing upside down. And kids suffer when they come before the spouse in the relationship. Um, if you put your spouse first, your kids will turn out better than if you put the kids ahead of your spouse. And that's, that's true in every relationship. You can do the research yourself, find out about it. But your spouse has to come before your kids. Um, and when you do that, your kids will benefit greatly. Um, if you're contemplating or preparing for marriage, so we have a lot of single people here tonight. Thank you for being here, by the way. I'm so thrilled to have singles uh, joining us <laughs> when we're talking about marriage. Um, so the question is, on whom do you depend most right now? Uh, if you're single, who is, who's the person that you lean on the heaviest? How will that relationship change once you are married? If you're planning to get married at some point, you may or may not have someone in your life right now. But if that happens, how will that change your relationship with that person that you rely on now? Number three, describe several areas of your lives where you and your beloved have grown together during courtship. So if you are dating, uh, how have you uh, been able to draw closer to your uh, significant other? What things do you need to leave behind as you prepare for marriage? So as you uh, prepare for marriage, what are some things that you need to uh, leave behind? All very good questions to ask. These are in your notes. Um, hopefully everybody had their notes. I forgot to mention earlier tonight that they are already uploaded into the Dropbox folder. We should have had an email last week with the access to all of that. And I did load that in there before this evening's uh, service or broadcast, whatever you want to call this. Um, so it's, it's available to you. Praise God. I am going to stop recording. And thank you if you're watching this at a later time.